and welcome to In Conservation With. Um, today it, it's Moya in the hot seat, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm joined by the absolutely amazing Indy Green, who I've admired uh, on social media, who's done some absolutely fantastic conservation work, uh, takes brilliant photos. Uh, so would you like to introduce yourself, Indy? Hi everyone, like Maya said, my name is Indy, I'm 15 years old and I volunteer with the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust and the BTO, um, doing our best to protect nature and wildlife and I live in the heart of Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire, in fact Sherwood Forest is right behind this wall, you can see on this giant map here and actually some cool birds there, I want to win best background tonight, great spot, mm -hmm. hot tree creeper, top stuff. And um, yes, and I'm really passionate about the topic that we're going to talk about tonight, raptor persecution. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, so I'm very jealous of where you live. Uh, I've already told you this already. Um, so what sort of wildlife do you see in Sherwood Forest? Oh, um, a lot of stuff actually. So we've got some great birds like lesser spotted woodpeckers, hawfinches, um, you can red start spotted flycatchers all in the summer. And uh, recently, even today, I saw a couple of goshawks, which is really cool. So a lot of you will be familiar with sparrowhawks, um, which is a more common garden species. We'll often take your goldfinches and the blue tits. Um, but this basically a super sparrowhawk, kind of twice the size, this absolute beast that rules the woods. And um, I'm lucky enough to have quite a few um, just mulling around the woods around here, around the garden. I saw a couple today hunting some wood pigeons as they do. Um, so yeah, lots of cool birds around here. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm very jealous. <laughs> um, so I also saw, uh, I think it was back in the summer that you set up um, uh, a hide, was it? And you had sort of yellow wagtails and crossbills. And yeah, so tell us a bit about more about that. Yeah, so I actually saw some crossbills today. I actually got my first ever crossbill selfie today. Um, I was just filling up the bird feeders and there was a, and the three crossbills uh, came and landed in the tree next to me. And I thought, nice, I got a quick selfie with the crossbills. And um, yeah, so uh, during the summer, especially this summer, especially the sort of first couple of weeks during lockdown, it was really, really dry. And we hadn't had any rain for ages, dry in more ways than one. Um, but, and then there was this uh, small pool just in front of, um, kind of next to my garden that I topped up um, throughout the summer with water. And I set up a little hide next to it. And I got loads of fantastic birds, like you say, yellow wagtails coming to drink there, crossbills finches, tree pipits, and all the common stuff like chaffinches, goldfinches, and blue tits. So that was a big success. Wow, well, yeah, I was very impressed with the photos. They were pretty amazing. So um, I always wondered, so how did you get into nature? What sort of age? Have you always been interested or? Um, yeah, I've always been interested. I mean, I suppose having Sherwood Forest right here and being that being my playground for ever since I was, you know, that high. Um, it's I've had a bit of a bit of a advantage with that so I've always been out there and I just couldn't really help but fall in love with it and my parents are both big wildlife fans um, so I was obviously quite inspired by them and um, yeah again like I said with Sherwood here I, it just couldn't go wrong. No, I don't blame you. So did you have sort of a bird that sort of sparked your interest or was it just general wildlife? Oh um well, I saw a lot, a lot of cool birds all the time because it was, um, I mean, even just sort of more common birds that a lot of people uh, might take for granted, like great spotted woodpeckers and red wings and field fares. So just discovering cool birds like that was always quite a highlight. Um, but then, of course, recently with the goshawks, they've just got me absolutely hooked with their biggest talon on their claw. So um, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely the goshawks at the moment that are my sort of biggest mm. pull towards being interested in nature. So you see, do you see them every day or...? Pretty much, yeah, they nest just about a five minute walk just over there um, and they roost literally about 20 metres behind this wall and there's a barn I go up and stand uh, about probably about 50 metres walk from my front door and um, whenever I've got a bit of spare time in the evening um, and I'll just walk up and almost pretty much guarantee to see a goshawk when they fly to roost in the evening. So um, that's, um, yeah, I do pretty much see them most days. Wow, yeah, that's pretty amazing. I think yeah, a lot of people would be jealous about that. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, it's, it's rare to get such good such good views of these birds because they're just so elusive. So a lot of people do get quite. Mm. Yeah, I've I've tried to see them once um, around where I live uh, in the winter, but uh, I was standing there for like a few hours, but I just did not see one. I mean, 
they can be pretty elusive, can't, can't they? Well, that, that's exactly why I love them, really, because they're just, they, they just, oh, they, they, I mean, they just pounce on prey for, didn't even know it was there. They just wave in, in and out of the trees, just pulling their wings in, fitting through spaces that you wouldn't even feel possible from a bird from that size. So, and I just love that I was watching one um, yesterday and this evening, actually, it was being mobbed by a crow and it just thought, oh, I've had enough of this crow. So it just dived down into this woodland like this cruise missile. And the wood pigeons just went bang and they just exploded. So I just love that. I, I just love that, like, they don't stop for nothing. If, if they want to go somewhere, they go there. Yeah, so I think that leads us quite nicely onto the topic uh, of today's Zoom, uh, which is raptor persecution. So um, it's also a topic I'm quite passionate about as well. Um, I remember back when I was doing GCSEs. Um, we do an English speaking exam and I, I actually did mine about banning driven grouse shooting because uh, obviously the hen harry day and how badly the hen harriers are persecuted so it's an issue sort of I feel quite strongly about and I can't believe we're still talking about it we're still having to we're still seeing all these birds of prey persecuted I think it's just awful really um, yeah so perhaps you could tell us uh, for those who don't know what raptor persecution is yeah, so I will um, get stuck into the slideshow now. I'm probably going to be talking for about maybe half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, and I should warn you, there are some quite gruesome images in here. I'll try and warn you when they come on, um, including some pretty, pretty tragic stories. So um, you've been warned. So bear with me and I will start sharing. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we can see that. There we are, bear with me. There we are, can we all see that? Okay, thumbs up. Yep, can see that. Super. Right, so thank you very much for having me. Um, this is all gonna be about raptor persecution and the plights that our raptors in the UK face. So um, the RSPB Raptor Persecutions Investigation Team is what I've been basing this on, and I should thank um, the fantastic Jenny Shelton from the team who sent me this. Um, who sent me this PowerPoint to share with you all tonight. So this is the investigations team, and they exist to help detect and prevent bird of prey persecution. And they basically gather intelligence and assist the police and advocate for changes uh, when it comes to the illegal pers persecution of our raptors. So these are some of the illegal methods of persecution that we'll be covering this evening. Um, so you've got shooting, trapping, poisoning, disturbance or destruction of nests and egg collecting. And these are issues that the team has to deal with pretty much every day. So this is, these are the findings of the bird, um, bird crime report that the RSPB published in October last year for the statistics from 2019. And as you can see, that's, that's a lot of birds of prey that have been illegally persecuted there. And that is 32 buzzards too many, that is 21 red kites too many, that is seven peregrines too many, that is six parahawks too many, that is four goshawks too many, that is three barn owls too many, that is two hen harriers too many, that's one golden eagle too many, that's one marsh harrier too many, that's one merlin too many, that is one kestrel too many, and that is one barn and one tawny owl too many. And that is just the tip of the iceberg because there are so many other unreported cases um, which will, which the RSV we don't know about. So these are the only ones we know about, and even that seems like quite a high total. So this is one of the most shocking incidents that the RSV had to deal with um, last year. So this hen harrier was found in a trap on a Scottish grouse moor, and you can see that it's a pretty. Yeah, you can even just look at the picture and tell there's a pretty strong trap, and this is called a spring trap. And you can see the metal plate just there, which is designed for the birds for the bird to step into. And then the metal beams there, they clamp shut on its leg. And it is then um, unable to, and then well, the leg will either fall off um, or it will just unfortunately die in agony. So, and in this particular case, there was actually another spring trap um, in this um, in this pair's nest designed so when the other um, when the other adult returns it will also get caught but thankfully um, the team removed that trap before the other adult returned so unfortunately as you can see this bird had to be euthanized because the vets although it was immediately taken there they couldn't rescue the bird um, they couldn't rescue the leg or the bird 
Now, this next slide is the rather gruesome one. This is a peregrine that was caught in a similar trap. It also didn't unfortunately make it. So you can see there just the sheer power of that trap there. So you see the plate again, that's where the bird would step into and then the clamps would go tight on its leg and it wouldn't be able to move. And these traps are often put out on plucking posts or fence posts, just perches that birds will often like to sit on um, when they're having a rest or just looking around their territory. Um, and little do they know that imminent death is on that fence post. And I should also say that these traps have been banned for over a hundred years, yet we are still seeing this happening today. So shooting um, is one of the far is one of the far most common cases that the RSPB has to deal with. This particular red kite was shot in Bedfordshire a couple of years ago. And as you can see on the X-ray of the bird there, that's 10 pieces of shot. And astonishingly, these weren't all from one attempt at shooting the bird. It turned out that the bird had been sh shot twice on, on separate occasions and it had survived the first time. And then it was shot again and it unfortunately didn't make it. Um, red kites have had quite a bit of success in the past few years. Um, throughout throughout the UK, and you can see them in quite a few places now. But unfortunately, cases like this will push them back. So, poisoning. Now, this buzzard was found um, near Vale House Reservoir in the Peak District in, in 2019. And it was lying next to the remains of a red-legged partridge. And buzzards, although they will take live prey, they are predominantly scavengers. So if they, they will take things like roadkill, they can scavenge, um, or, or dead game birds like this red-legged partridge that he thought, oh, this is a fantastic treat. But little did he know that it was actually poisoned with, with a highly toxic pesticide that killed it on site. So, and this was actually found very close to a public footpath. So it does also threat, um, pose a threat two people, of course, as well. And it was in an area surrounded by driven grouse moors. So why is this happening? Well, raptor persecution is a particular problem on areas that's um, used for driven grouse. So where these areas are absolutely huge swathes of land that um, intent intensively manage to support the highest number of grouse that they, that they would then shoot. And um, predators are often systematically and illegally killed on these areas, but unfortunately it's not just the occasional rogue gamekeeper doing this. The RSPB has witnessed um, sort of mass gatherings of, um, of efforts from gamekeepers trying to wipe out any, and any known predators on their land that will threaten the grouse stocks. So we know who's doing it, but where? And I can tell you it's everywhere. This map shows every confirmed raptor persecution case that we know about. Like I said earlier, there will still be more, but these are the ones we know about. And there is pretty much no county that is unaffected. Um, the black and the red squares are mostly kind of situated in the Peak District, North Yorkshire and Scotland. And pretty much all of those areas are areas that is dominated by driven grouse moors. Um, one species that is affected most by um, raptor persecution is the fantastic hen harrier. Now, while I'm talking, just take a moment to appreciate how stunning this bird is. Just look at the beauty of that bird. What an absolute fantastic species. So it is one of the rarest breeding birds in England. And um, in 2020, there were only 19 successful nests that were recorded, though there is habitat and prey for more than three 100 pairs, but we have 19. In 2019, the government published its analysis of satellite tagging of hen harriers, and it found that illegal killing was the principal factor suppressing hen harrier numbers in the UK. Get your head around that. So this is the issue. So there was a lot of noise last year about the fact that over 60, uh, that there were 60 hen harrier chicks which fledged in England. And here you're seeing the picture of a nest of seven chicks, which is quite a high number, considering that the average brood size of hen harriers is around four to five. But it's not the concern of the hen harriers actually raising the chicks successfully. It's what happens after they fledge. So there was a paper that was based on information from 58 young hen harriers, with, so a similar number to the numbers that fledged in 2020-60. And their findings showed that only 17% of the hen harriers made it through to their first year. 
because a high number of that percentage were either confirmed or considered likely to have been illegally killed. So the reckoning from the 2020 broods is that only 10 of those 60 chicks that successfully fledged will make their first year. Only 10 out of 60. So this bit is the bit that really annoys me. So because goshawks are a species I'm really, really passionate about and I see them almost on a day-to-day -day basis, it pains me to say that um, the Northern Peak District used to be the go-to place to see goshawks in the UK. But in the early 2000s, this changed dramatically. A study that came out in 2018 focusing on the Peak District a national park that attracts over 10 million visitors a year is now written, has now got the very, very fitting name as the black hole for birds of prey. The paper looked at goshawk and peregrine populations. It found that both had increased in the south where there is no driven grouse shooting and had declined in areas where there was driven grouse moors. So we know where it's happening, but who's doing it? Well, the evidence is pretty clear. This pie chart shows that um, the profession of those that are convicted of raptor persecution since 1990. And you can see that almost two thirds of those have been gamekeepers, along with other interests of pigeon fanciers, which often have a big interest, um, big impact on, pig, on um, peregrine populations. So we, we do know where it's happening and we know who's doing it. So I would like you to meet, this is a Bolan Betty and she's a fantastic hen harrier that was tagged in Lancashire. And this was this, well, a tagging hen harriers is a main part, and tagging any bird, a prey species, is a primary part of the RSPB investigation's job um, to work out where they are being caught out um, and where they're being illegally shot. And then they can try and bring some justice to the killers. So this um, tagging project is part of the EU Life Project. And um, they've, fit, they've been doing this, I believe, since 2014. Now, these small tags, they don't affect the bird at all. They just sit on their backs and they place them on when they're about, um, about a month old. So the trained professionals who do this are all licensed to do this. Um, the chicks won't fly off when they carefully approach the nest, um, but they are still old enough to make it. And these tags don't affect this. They're just like little backpacks that stick and um, that stay with the chicks um, for, the, for all their lives, hopefully. Now, just imagine, you are the person who has attached this tag to this hen harrier, this absolutely beautiful hen harrier. And you've put it back and you've put this bird back in the nest and you wish it well because you know the perils it might face. You wish it well. And the next time you see Bowden and Betty, you see her like this. Sadly, Bowden and Betty's life was cut short. The tracker was still working, which enabled the team to find her. The x-ray showed that she'd been shot. This is unusual to actually find a hen harriet that's been shot because most of the time once a bird has been deliberately killed they very rarely find the bodies so and the tags also disappear. Since 2018 45 of the tagged hen harriers have disappeared or vanished under suspicious circumstances. Many of them and I mean many of them were disappeared over grouse moors. I'd like you to meet two other new hen areas, Manu and Mark, brothers both tagged in a nest on the Scottish borders. Manu's tag suddenly stopped working as ever over a grouse moor in Northumberland just months after fledging. No tag or body was found. His brother, Mark, a few months later, flew over a grouse moor in the North Pennines. Um, the tag cut out, they searched, but there was no sign of the tag or the beautiful hen harrier. So both of them were likely to have been killed and the tags would have probably been destroyed. This is another bird. This one is called Bryn. And this bird actually died of natural causes in France. So, but the tag still enabled the team to find them. So two of the team hopped over to France to find Bryn's body. And after, um, after post-mortem was confirmed that he did die of natural causes. Um, so these tags, I should also say, have um, only a 6% 6, 6 uh, fail rate, so they are extremely reliable and um, pretty, pretty unbreakable. But the thing that shocks me as well 
is the actual lengths that the killers will go to hide up a crime. So in 2016, a golden eagle uh, went missing over a grouse moor in Perthshire. And the team made a pretty big discovery when this was reported to them. This summer, the eagles, that golden eagles tag that went missing in 2016 was spotted by a man and his son out on a casual walk um, up in the peaks, I believe again. And it was just down, this tag was found in a river just downstream from its last transmission. It had been wrapped in lead, presumably to stop it transmitting, the tra transmitting with the straps that the bird would have been attached to. So that is just the sort of length that it will go to, that they will go to to cover up their crimes. So as well as tagging and monitoring birds, the field work team are all, always, always, always busy roaming the moors um, looking for signs of wrongdoing. You can actually see on this fence post one of those spring traps um, that we were talking about earlier. And you can see that that'd be a perfect perch for a bird of prey to come and sit and chill out, look over their territory, look for some food. But little do they know, they may never take off from that perch again. Finding the killers and catching them red handed is very hard, but sometimes the team is in the right place at the right time. This is a short eared owl and is on Wernside Moor in Cumbria, and this story is from 2017. Now, short eared owls are in long term decline. They're a specialist that feed on mainly small mammals and they prefer open moorland habitats. And in 2017, then some of the some of the investigations team were monitoring a moor in Cumbria when they saw a gamekeeper shoot a short-eared owl in door in broad daylight. This person then raised his gun and shot another. They grabbed their camera and started filming. You can see the gamekeeper there highlighted in the green circle. They recorded him retrieving the two dead owls that he'd shot. He, he was stamping on one and pressing it into the ground and he hid another in a dry stone wall. By now, the team had called the police. Whilst they waited for the police, one of the fantastic investigation officers, Guy, who's 56 years young, who's fit as a fiddle, ran down and stopped the gamekeeper from driving off. The gamekeeper turned around and started running on the moors, so Guy went in pursuit of him. And after a short chase, the police arrived, like the, casual, like the cavalry over the hill, and they arrested the, game, the keeper there and then. In the car, they also found a decoy and a tape lure to encourage birds of prey to um, come towards where his gun was pointing at them. He pleaded guilty to the killing of the two owls and was fined a very disappointing just over a thousand pounds. Now, of course, there was quite a buzz from the investigations team for actually witnessing and capturing all this action on camera, um, which they did an amazing job at. But of course, the fine was just a drop in the ocean, considering that this particular estate charges 30k for a day's shooting. So here we are, convictions. The red line shows the convictions and the, bar, the blue bars are the uh, rapid persecution incidents. Um, so you can see that the um, number of convictions is much lower than what it needs to be, considering the amount of illegal crime going on. And in 2017 in particular, there was no convictions at all. There's a number of reasons for this, um, mostly police resources, but if there's rarely any evidence that leads us to the, that leads the um, team to the culprit, then it's hard for the police to follow up because even if they have the bird's body that has either been shot in that area and they, they will know in their hearts who did it and they may have the facts to say who did it, um, if the estate denies it, then there's not much else the team or the police can do. So during lockdown, we all remember it. The first one during May and April, um, May and April, um, the team was actually busier than it's ever been before. And Jenny, who put this report together, writes here, she's never known it so busy. Um, so unfortunately, unfairly, a lot of people took this opportunity. While everyone, while they thought they weren't being watched, they went up onto the moors and persecuted birds of prey in increased numbers like no one's ever seen before. So the investigations team published the absolute hell out of this. And as you can imagine, um, the general public was absolutely shocked to find out what people were doing um, while, they were, while they were supposed to be um, staying at home. And they were going, breaking lockdown rules and going up to deliberately kill wildlife. And this is one of those cases. A member of the public found this injured buzzard near, um, in the Peak District 
um, on the 11th of May 2020. It was taken to a vet's immediately, but unfortunately, it could not be saved. The body was x-rayed and six pieces of shot were identified. However, again, similar to the red kite earlier on, it became clear that these weren't all from one particular shooting incident. It had been shot on two occasions and it had survived the first time, but unfortunately it had perished on the next. Like I said, public awareness really grew during lockdown um, because of all the killing that was happening. And even just before I came on here, I discovered that another hen harrier has been shot um, on a grouse moor again. So in May, Channel 4 um, fantastically ran this um, feature, um, which followed a police ex in inspection as they retrieved four, four dead buzzards from Barnsdale Moor, which all turned out to be shot. And now this next story, I must warn you, I was, is, is, is really bad. It's really bad, so prepare yourself. Meet Molly and Poppy, two spaniels. They were being taken out on a family walk out in North Yorkshire and the Yorkshire Dales. Both spaniels became violently ill suddenly after, after the walk. They were immediately rushed to a local vet. Poppy was saved, but unfortunately it was too late for Molly. Toxicology tests showed that both had consumed deadly mixtures of chemicals. This was the exact same mixture that killed two red kites and a buzzard in the same area near Pateley Bridge on previous occasions. It is believed that both dogs inadvertently came across poison bait placed illegally in the countryside to target birds of prey. This area is surrounded by grouse moors and Jenny writes here that she spoke to the family who was still in shock by what, they, by what happened and that their dog had gone from being all bouncy to well in the morning, just gone. They have no doubt about what happens and neither do I. Unfortunately, the response to many of the lockdown crimes was not sufficient from the game, from the shooting community. Um, the third, the third um, quote down really speaks volumes because I don't think that they really are benefiting the wider public, the wider public, and I don't think they are protecting the rarest breeding birds because we should have 300 pairs of hen areas in, the, in England and we have 90. So it is clearer day by day what's happening on the, on the moors of Northern England, but instead of responding with shock and outrage and a shock and outrage and offering to work with the RSPB and the police, the shooting industry's response to these lockdown crimes was more defensive. But the public have had enough, and I'm sure after all this you will have too. This summer, over a hundred thousand people emailed their MPs urging them to take action now to protect wildlife and habitats of our uplands for people and nature. And I remember um, Chris Packham talking to um, Labour's Angela Rayner, and she said that some of her colleagues were getting quite frustrated about the number of emails that they were receiving about raptor persecution and people wanting to stand up for what's right, and they were wondering how it could stop. And I think I believe her response was stop by doing some action, which is what needs to happen just like this. So the government need to wake up, recognise there's a problem and act. Currently, the laws are ineffective and there is, and there is very little deterrent. And as I said earlier, very, very little convictions. And yeah, they need, they need, to, get, they need to get a move on. So how can you help? So this is a picture of 10 buzzards that were found in a gamekeeper's shed in Norfolk in a sack. And this discovery came as a result of just one phone call. And reports like this from the public are absolutely vital to the RSPB's work. You are the RSPB's eyes and ears. If you notice a dead or injured bird of prey or notice any suspicious activity, then call the police initially on 101 and check out this. So don't touch anything, take pictures and call 101. Don't remove birds from traps. So this is a crow cage trap. These are actually legal. And if there's a crow inside, then it is still legal because it's for the purpose of catching other crows. But if there's a bird like a pigeon inside, then it is quite, then it's quite possibly to lure in a raptor like a goshawk for, for example, because this definitely looks like some goshawk habitat. 
Um, and if there is a bird of prey inside, don't release it, just alert the police and the RSPB. Um, and similarly to any reports of um, spring traps on the ground or on posts, report them to the same organisations too. The RSPB is also um, on Twitter as well, the RSPB Birders account, which I'm a big fan of, which has got some superb content following all of the ongoings, all, all the ongoings of this. And um, it's, it's really important you follow them because they have some great content. Um, crime at rsvb.org.uk is another good email address um, to report any sightings to and have a look at the bird of prey, um, bird of prey, um, yeah, bird of prey report that they published back in October, which summarises pretty much everything of what I've been talking about. So, brilliant. Uh, thank you. Carry on. So yeah, very uh, emotive issue that is, and. Um, one that angers me very much, I think. Um, I wondered if it happens in other countries. I don't know, maybe Dennis maybe could uh, put a few words in, but I, I don't know. I know Malta has a particular issue. I saw Chris Packer and Megan were out there a few years ago now, wasn't it, uh, with songbirds, but I'm not sure if other countries have issues with this. Um, I believe, we yeah. Do not I it's really bad. Yeah. Oh, oh go on, Dennis. <laughs> okay, we do not have that issue in, uh, in the US. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act here, um, Migratory Bird Treaty is a treaty among North American countries to protect migratory birds. And in the US, there's, there's the law of Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which prevents any kind of harassing, taking, uh, even uh, going to the nests of migratory birds. You can't possess any part of a migratory bird, dead or alive. Um, and uh, there, there are uh, penalties under the law and the, the Fish and Wildlife Service here takes it very, very seriously and uh, works hard to uh, to find the perpetrators of any any bird killings. Of course, uh, in the last four years, things have uh, not been quite so smooth here. Um, and uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act has been under constant assault uh, to uh, to make it easier for principally corporations to be able to uh, kill birds that are interfering with, with their work. But in terms of people like grouse hunters, there's no such thing here. Mm. Okay, thank yeah. you for that, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah M Malta does have a very big problem um, because that's one of the main migration routes for a lot of birds. Um, and unfortunately, um, especially birds like honey buzzards um, that are traveling back and forth to Africa and spend, this, uh, spend their spring and summers in the UK. They are very, very heavily persecuted. And a friend um, I know quite well who works on the work parties, um, and um, she was recently in Malta um, um, for the autumn migration, um, trying to protect as many birds as they can. And she said it was just heartbreaking that any, bu any honey buzzard or any other species, to be honest, that goes there. I believe pretty much the motto that she spoke, uh, people, the, well, she was told that their motto was if it flies, it dies. So it is, it is a very big issue there, um, as it is here, to be honest. Um, but yeah, um, I was going to say, I hope people enjoyed that, but I really, I, I don't really want you to enjoy that because you should take something from that. And hopefully, um, do check out the RSPB's website um, about uh, talking about raptor crime and support them any way you can. And um, thank you for that, Dennis, that American insight. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for that. Um, very interesting. I just can't believe it's still going on. I can't believe we still have blood sport. Like, I don't know to see how it's called a sport. I just, honestly, I don't really, I just can't believe it's still going on. And uh, like all the pressure that's on the government and politicians, I just, do you think they're doing enough or? No, it's, it's clear that they're not doing enough because they, um, 
especially what we saw recently where I think it was the second lockdown, I'm losing count of how many they've been, um, it was the one in November um, when Boris Johnson exempt the rule of six uh, for grouse shooters. So it's extraordinarily clear that he's on their side and clearly doesn't give a damn at all. So it's, it's, it's very clear that they're just really just trying to avoid the fact and even I've, I've even heard cases of when these um, investigation issues, when they go to court, um, because a lot of um, wealthy people are in on the grouse shooting jazz as well. And even the, um, you know, even the people who are in court who are supposed to be sort of, what's the word, um, sort of open minded to these issues, they still, they're, they're still biased on one side. So, yeah, it, it's clear that 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 you really are trying to bang your head against the brick wall when it comes to trying to get any sort of penalties through. Mm. Yeah, it's a difficult issue. I mean, I think we just have to keep emailing MPs, keep putting pressure on uh, via social media or whatever we can, really. I think it's just, just got to keep putting pressure on because we've got to get them to change. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, I think, yeah, absolutely right. I think it is an issue where the tide is slowly turning because of things like this. And um, I hope I've enlightened you, all of some of you to this issue, um, because I think public awareness is definitely growing. And, um, and of course, that e-action that um, Chris Pack and Wild Justice and Henner Action put together back in the summer, over 100,000 people, well, it was way more than that. And there will be others beside, besides um, that care about this issue and want and want the you know their MPs to do something about it. So it's clear that the public are really really fed up of this. So they're going to have to start listening soon, and they're really going to like, start to lose a lot of support. Mm. Yeah, I think Dennis, do you have your hand up? Do you want to say something? Yes, that's not to say there's no hunting here, mm. but hunting is uh, it's not a sport, but it's an yeah. activity that. Uh, a group of friends will go out on a on a duck boat uh, and and hunt ducks, or they'll go uh, on a on a trip into a forest to hunt deer, and they'll spend all day in a uh, in a hunt blind on in a tree for deer to pass, and often, most likely. They're going to be unsuccessful, but it's it's not it's not about killing as much as you can. It's about tracking and and so forth as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I think Chris yeah, exactly because um, that's why. Yeah, oh, sorry. sorry you, uh, I think Chris had his hand up as well. If you'd like to say something. Hi there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Indy, for the presentation. There. Um, very impressive young man and um, like sad that you know, it was an interesting presentation, but sad. Um, I live in Northumberland and um, sort of uh, game shooting, et cetera, is a, a way of life up here. Um, it's an absolutely huge industry and um, people pay, I've seen people pay like tens of thousands of pounds for the opportunity. Um, the owners of these estates are powerful people who have a lot of links into um, Parliament, etc. And I don't think it's something, sadly, that's going to change. I think great likes so of yourself, Maya and Indy. I think in time, I think a lot of the younger people, um, as you grow older, I think it'll gather momentum, but certainly in Northumberland, um, it's a fairly large industry in our region, other than tourism. Um, but the other thing I was going to say was um, recently before Christmas, um, my parents came across a grounded barn owl um, close to a, a local estate. Um, I contacted a local wildlife rescue um collected it, handed it over. A couple of days later, it came back after the x-rayed it. It had multiple leg fractures and sadly that euthanized it. Um, you know, we're sort of wondering what on earth, you know, how could it have multiple leg fractures? And um, thought it might have glanced off a car, but then my father was talking to somebody and said, um, there's sometimes um, traps are put on fence posts. 
and um, that would lead itself to um, the multiple leg fractures that would explain that. So, um, yeah, it's kind of how do we, you know, do the do you report it to say the RSPB anonymously, um, and then do they start to monitor estates and what have you? Um, you know, like kind of where I live, it's a, one of them things. If you sort of report something, um, you know, it's a very close knit community. So you know, you you sort of um, put your you sort of um, possibly like your livelihood at risk. Not that I'm a, I have anything to do with gamekeeping or anything like that. I'm an accountant by trade, but um, there's a lot of connections. You know, certainly in the area, and it's something that um, I think you do have to be careful of. Yeah, I, I can definitely understand that. Um, and there's a particular group on Twitter, I won't name them, but I know they've been um, targeting and harassing quite a lot of people. And it's, it, it's really not been nice stuff. And a lot of those people have been um, subjected to quite a lot of trolling from it. So, um, again, I should also say some gamekeepers. There are some very good, respectful gamekeepers out there. But um, we're talking about the ones that aren't, and there are quite a lot of them. Um, so yeah, and that's a fortunate group that does a lot of um, that has a lot of backlash against people who try and stand up for what's right. Um, the RSPB does have a hotline where I believe you can anon um, anonymously report cases like that. Um, was it a bar now? Yeah, it was a bar now. Yeah, multiple like fractures. Um, I'd say at the time we thought it was a bit odd. You know, thought like you know it was away from a road and. You know, probably not con um, anything to do with like a car clip in it. But then my dad was talking to somebody who knows a lot about birds and things like that. And he said he thought it was close to an estate and the multiple leg fractures would sort of ally itself with being caught in a trap and then yeah. just being released and left on the ground. See, again, yeah, that's, um, see, I suppose. Um, I can't really think of another word, fear, but sort of maybe anxiety to hold back on that report um, is another thing that I strongly, um, another reason why I'm against the whole driven ground shooting kind of thing, because nobody should have to feel, um, um, not saying you're frightened, but nobody should have to feel kind of unsure about or wary about, um, um, I'm, 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 I mean, I know they're not going to really do anything to you, but not sort of their safety and um, just... You know, like, for example, Chris Packham gets a load of foxes and crows dumped on his gate. Um, yeah. often, I'm quite a lot. So you don't sort of want to subject yourself to that. So it's, it's again, you don't want to be have to do, you want, you don't, you want to feel safe when you're walking around. So you don't want to have to deal with things like that. So that's another reason why it's, it's just really outdated because that's not um, what we should be promoting in the rural villages like that. There should be peaceful, nice places, good wildlife, you know, um, just, yeah, it, 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 yeah, that's just, it, it shouldn't be like that. Um, but yeah, I'm very sorry you had to find that bar now. I wish that didn't happen. Um, but that's um, it, it sounds like right, that's happening all over the country. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know I'd like to applaud like so yourself and um, like Maya um, and you know people like yourselves. I think um, I think that's the best hope. Really, I think you know over the next five ten years for a change. I think your sort of generation are going to be the ones who were going to drive it and um, for you know, public perception to change and then you know that will translate into um, you know people in parliament like having to listen otherwise you know they're probably going to be out of a job um, you know so um, you know best like you know thank you and best of luck. Thank you Chris thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah so I think it's a generally you need to get more public awareness I think is the way to go as well so I think that brings the main part of this in conservation with to a close. But I'd like to say thank you very much, Indy, for joining us today and letting everyone know about this very poignant and uh, important issue.